the best piece of advice I could tell anybody is to not get way too emotional about keeping every piece of property that you have. Yeah. So we know you, you love to travel. I think you're definitely on the travel leaderboard from, uh, from the three of us. Once I got to that point where I felt like I had done well and I wanted to go kind of enjoy some of my success at the time, um, I started traveling. And what I did love about traveling was it taught me how to delegate. We were on the flight and I actually used, I think, something absurd, like 60,000 American airline points or something to book, to pay for my Wi-Fi on the flight. And Phil actually almost choked me on the plane because that's the same amount of points he used to book his entire first class flight to Hong Kong. You know what it takes to sell real estate? The art of putting the deal together. I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing this because this is my calling. I believe in it. I love it. Try to master your craft and don't give up. Even if the money's not coming in, just trust the process. Because you're only as good as your team. I learned that the hard way. Half of it is talent. The other half of it is what your people skills are. Today's show, we have Eddie Waters. Um, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Before we get going here, quick little intro about um, Eddie. Eddie has been in the real estate business for over 10 years. He has sold over 300 million in deals. We call him the GOAT or the King of Tucson. Um, he, he grew up here. You've been involved in residential and investment uh, side of business for a long time. You have a team of over 10 agents. Yeah. Um, you're the founder and owner of Local Real Estate Group, and without further ado, the king of Tucson. I love it. Well, thank you guys for having me on the podcast. Excited to see what we can talk about today and kind of run through everything. Perfect, perfect. So obviously, we're going to make Alan happy as always. Make sure to subscribe, like, follow, share, and all the good stuff. The video is going to be all over the place and on all the different podcast channels. Um, and cool life right into it. Um, first question, obviously, always is like, how did you get into real estate? And kind of what you do, like walk us through your first year, how you got started. I got started like most real estate agents do. Um, someone kind of mentioned the opportunity to me and I thought there was a pretty low barrier of entry. It was something that really appealed to me. And um, once I got up and running, I found out that I kind of had a niche for it based on things I've done in the past. Um, construction and design, those were some of my favorite things to do. So getting into real estate and implementing those things that I really love to do into the business helped me kind of grow the company a lot faster than I anticipated. And we just kind of snowballed from a single agent up into a real estate team. And um, it, was, it was a good experience. You know, I like it, happy where we've grown to. So you have 10 agents right now. Tell us a little bit about how you started building the team and you know, what are the challenges? Because we get that question a lot of times, like should we do a team, should we be a pro? Like, What's the challenge? Because I think a lot of people underestimate running a team. And what, do you, yeah, what do you enjoy the most? Yeah, so I mean, if I think about it, I met with you guys way back in the day before you had the real estate team, the brokerage, everything, you know? And I think the biggest thing is you guys knew then was like for me, just starting with that first piece, um, which for me at the time was an assistant. So I was an independent agent. I hired an assistant. Once myself and my assistant got too busy, we brought on a buyer's agent. We kind of just kept taking those steps until we had 10 agents and before you know it, um, it kind of happens a lot quicker than you think once you get the momentum and you have the business coming in. It's just really piecing those small steps together to get where you're going. How's the, how's the setup? So you got 10 agents. I know you have your, your assistant, Chelsea. Yeah. Like, give us a little bit of insight of how you set up right now and how you, how you split up your day. You know, well, how, much, how much goes into the agent side of the business, right? Yeah. How much goes into the actual team side of the business, right? Which is not necessarily transactional, right? That's more like the personnel part and how much time do you spend on the development and investment side? Yeah, and so what I typically do is I normally have about two assistants on my team, one that helps me kind of run the team, one that helps me with the more personal side of getting all my flips, rentals, utilities, insurance, all that stuff handled for the business. That's Chelsea, right? Yeah, so Chelsea helps me with that um, kind of personal side and component, but also is like the administrative, helps me with the team agreements and the brokerage side. 
And then I normally have an assistant that helps me with my showings, emailing clients when I'm unavailable. If I'm out of town, they're helping me kind of take care of the day-to-day -day operations that I can do. So I'm communicating with the clients, I'm negotiating the offers, I'm making sure that all the critical parts are getting taken care of. But if we need to get a client in to get the doors opened or anything like that, one of my assistants is helping me knock out those tasks. And then, um, as you guys know too, the uh, fix and flip side of the business was really big for me before the recent market change. And now we've really turned that fix and flip business more into a rental and holding company business. So we're liquidating the last few of the flips and kind of moving more into the long-term rental flip for the good things like we've noticed, like tax advantages and other you know, long-term wealth plays. Yeah, which is a good point. I mean, we're doing the same thing. We're like transitioning a little bit from some of the developments, do more like buy and hold stuff. Like you said, market changes, you know, opportunity. Everybody, look, you know, we all learned a lot about tax implications on the multi family side. So maybe walk us a little bit through, like, um, we know the flips here, you obviously get out of good set with your family, being involved for a good brother that helped on the on the deal that we did, got your dad. So um, how are you set up on, on the construction side of things when you do get into these TS? Like how's everything? being managed. So we normally have four different general contractors that we work with on a regular basis. As you guys know, the one that just helped us with our apartment project, my father, he's awesome. He'll take care of us anytime. In addition to that, we've got three other general contractors that we work with. Each one of them kind of has a different style, a different structure and different finish type. But for the most part, we kind of stick to the same traditional things that we know work. We know they fit in the budget and we're trying to just get them knocked out in an efficient time, time frame. And for the most part, all of our contractors that we keep around are able to do that for us on a consistent basis, and that's why we keep them around. We know if we pass them the keys when we buy something, but it's gonna be taken care of when we get the keys back, and that's what we're looking for. How many deals a year do you do on the flip side? Um, on the flip side, the numbers used to be a lot higher, to be honest, um, we do anywhere around 15 flips at a given time. So probably around 40 flips a year, I'd say, we were doing a pretty good number. Now when we roll into it, I'm independent. I used to have partners in the flips. And um, because market changes and people's finances change and cash flow changes, it's only stuff to keep saying consistent partners. Um, unless you're just really doing well winning all the time, right? So I've moved to independent remodels and that's lowered the number, but it's also increased, you know, the amount of control we have over each deal was what we like. And something I want to touch uh, base on is, as you were speaking, we've known each other for uh, many years, right? And a lot of the things that we talk about or that we get, get asked is, you know, how do you uh, find the right business partner, right? How do you build that trust? Um, how long did it take until we actually started doing business together? I think we've been dating for a while, so I feel like definitely I've met with you boys a handful of times, you know, over the years. We always talk business, we always share notes, we compare projects, ideas, um, tax accounts, and kind of just gauge each other's level of business and where we want to take things. And I feel like when you're choosing to work or do business with someone, especially in long-term projects, it's very important to have that clear understanding up front of like what the objective is, make sure everybody's on the same page and everyone's got the same end goal in mind. And if you could do that, then I feel like you're in pretty good shape. I think it happened very organically too, right? It's not like when you sat down and said, let's do a deal now. It was more like, yeah. one day you called and said, hey, boys, maybe I might, might have the first deal for us, right? And it kind of like, it just randomly came up and we, you sent it over and we, we drove down, looked at it, and then we you know, obviously trusted you 100% because you have the gold of Tucson, right? <laughs> so if you said it's a good deal, we, we you know kind of went with it. And it's also surprising the, for all three of us, the first like bigger deal in World of Family right? It's, it's not like we start yeah. with a small small deal right no, out of the gates. We, right we jump right in. So yeah. maybe let's talk about that. Deal. Obviously we have the separate video that, um, that um, you guys will see on the channel that kind of like walks the property a little bit. But let's talk a little bit about that deal because um, we have got a lot of questions about it. Probably you do too. Um, so let's let's go a little bit through you know rough numbers acquisition where did the deal come from how did we actually take it down and then we kind of like go through the, the whole deal like maybe so. before we yeah. talk about the deal two more things I wanted to say um, just to full circle one it just it just takes time sometimes right you gotta be patient and generally build those relationships and things come comes together organically just in our case yeah the second thing is that you boys remember our. Uh, 
attempt to start a, a sign placement business. Oh, uh, absolutely. Open house yeah. sign. Uh, that was a non-starter, by the way. Yes, yeah, realized pretty quickly. A that lot of those people money. who wanted to get that business turned into wholesalers. <laughs> so, yeah. so they had the wholesale business. A lot of them. All right, let's talk about the deal yeah. right away. Um, okay, so that deal kind of came across our plate, and as you guys know, I think it's very important. Like accepting a deal and turning down a deal are two of the best things to make you money. If it's a wrong deal, you don't want to take it down. We've all learned that. Before we started today, we were talking about a big loss we had, right? So we're always cautious of those deals. And this deal happened to land on the desk of us and big project to take on. Plus it was sitting on the market for how many days? Correct, yeah, this was on the market for a little over 90 days. And um, the seller wanted to get out of the deal but they also didn't want to just fire sell the deal. So after we got in, we did our research and we had a ballpark idea of what the figures looked like. We were able to come in with a strong and educated offer, not just a low ball offer, and kind of show them how much it was gonna to take to get the deal done, what numbers worked and what numbers wouldn't work, that way we could put it together. And um, at that time- Financing the place with the construction component, right? Yep, exactly. And you guys brought the financing to the table. Um, from some of your other partners as well, which knocked it out of the park and made the deal even sweeter for us. Um, so I really think the biggest problem we had with that deal was just trying to figure out how we were gonna put all the pieces together with it being our first deal we ever took on together. Like you guys said, it wasn't a small deal we took on, so just getting it together, the Astro, opening the company, getting all those wheels kind of put on the bus and getting it moved down the road was just also awesome. And let's talk about those phases too. I mean, we just, we just shot an update uh, video together at the property, but let's talk about the phases because it's not like, you know, we just did everything at once. There were some tenants in place, right? But the yeah. property was like in uh, absolute terrible shape for the most part. Yeah. Inhabitable, we had no foundation, some of the units. Let's talk about that. Yeah, and as you guys know too, it's kind of hard for us when we're projecting the budget on the deal like this to really know what we're getting into until you open the walls and you can see the structural components, the framing, concrete foundation, stuff like that. So we had a few hurdles that we came into budget-wise on this one, but we overcame them in pretty efficient manners and we were able to still stay on track. I think we ended up going all in about 45,000 over budget, maybe 55, but for a project of this scale, I think that's pretty good for this. And we had the, the cash, all of us, available to, to kind of fund the surplus and we made decisions yep. quickly, right? We knew it's gonna cost what it's gonna cost. We made some improvements too, right? I remember when we talked about the fur, uh, the uh, the turf, we talked about um, those little, little patios there, right? So we added some value along the way and made conscious decisions yep. to spend more money to make it a really nice place to return to the day. Yeah, which that helps us get the higher rents, all of that stuff. And when you guys go back to talking about um, business partners and kind of selecting the right ones, what I like is you guys had experience kind of going into this. You know that not every project's gonna be on budget. Not every project's gonna be on the timeline. But None at the end of the day, none, <laughs> none of them. And, and the people in the business, they know that, but the major thing that you wanna know your partners can do is overcome those obstacles, make it seamless, smooth, and get things back on track. And that's what you guys did in this situation. And I think knowing you have partners that can fund the deal, provide valuable insight, and have good connections and resources, those are critical components. and understand value, right? I mean, we're all very synced. There was never any any situation where it was before going into that deal, or even now, what one and a half years later after we decided to buy this, yep. where you know Patrick and I were saying, I don't know, you know, we already agree with Eddie, we don't want to go that way. So, you know, I think that um, you know key key takeaway is being absolutely synced on top of having the trust and the same vision, because you know this is not just going to be one deal. I mean. You could talk about goals here in a second for us. And we did have like that hiccup, you know, we had, there was a, a forced per person in the deal at the very beginning, right? So we had to like, you know, again.
you know, this three people uh, team here, yeah. a new deal. Um, so right now the trouble is finding good deals. Like, where is the market at in Tucson? What do you see opportunity-wise, um, you know, on the horizon? Like, are there good deals coming? And what are the challenges right now with like not adding good deals? So I think the challenge we might be running into is when we're looking for these good deals, there's tons of competition, as you guys know. Um, a lot of California investors and heavy cash investors is what we see here in the Tucson marketplace. And they really want to buy these deals. They want to tie them up quick. They want to value add or just kind of run them the way they are and collect the rents. And so what we're looking to do is find something that's kind of off market that we kind of pick up direct to seller or a good cold seller that may have a connection, find that deal, put it together with them and then be able to have a good solid value add opportunity. But that's what we're looking for. And we always want to make it a win-win-win for us, wherever we find the deal, the seller, and ourselves. Yeah, that's so. it. To your point, like the, the deal we, we did together was in the market for 90 days. Nobody really wanted it. And, and uh, looking back now, it's an absolute home run deal, right? Yeah. So sometimes you have to create the value. It's not like black and white for everybody to see. Maybe um, to go back to our deal, kind of walk through the rents where they were when we first bought it, where we are right now, and how the whole like financial setup is at our seven. Just like the basic basic yeah. numbers. So we bought the property, we just we just went through the numbers again for a million, million eighty nine, right? Back yep. in end of uh, December of twenty twenty one. I think it was on the last Correct. we bought it on the last business day and a year later we refight it yep. on the last business day of the year. That's how we do it. And uh, what I really liked about the deal originally, guys, and you saw this too, is when you look at the performa of where the actual rents were, I mean, there's probably 75 to 85% vacancy on the building, which was huge. And so that means that no traditional bank's gonna finance that deal. It's gotta be a cash purchase or hard money acquisition. And the rents of the rented units were around $450 on the casinos, which you guys saw. And now we're renting those same casitas, fully renovated for around $1,100 a month. And when we so, say casita, right, we're talking about 320 square feet. You guys can check correct. out the, the other videos that we that we shot. It's a fairly um, compact living. Yeah, so right? 320 square feet, I mean, getting $1,100 a month for those is pretty impressive, but we knew what we were doing going into the deal. We targeted U of A students. We wanted really nice finishes, nice appliances. We gave nice laundry facilities, turf, corrugated steel fencing, made the buildings really modern, and we took pride of ownership in the building, which is one thing we all had kind of in common going into the project. If we're gonna do it, we want it to look nice and be something we can keep long-term, and that's what we did. So that's why we were able to get those rents. I don't think many people looked at it thinking they could get $1,100 a month in rent for those casitas when it was originally marketed for sale. Well, because nobody, you know, like Patrick's back to the value, right? Nobody uh, saw doing, doing such a value undertaking the way we did it, right? Correct. Which is pretty much all, close yeah. to a new build in some of the instances of those, all those uh, units. Yep, and that worked out great for all of us. You know, the tax advantages, everything that comes with that big of a project was perfect, and that's why we're looking for the next one now. And I think the other thing we all agreed on, which is good, and you'd always see that we all agreed to do it right, and I, like you just mentioned, you sub floors, you, you know, like new roof, new AC, so like it's basically almost like up to new construction at that point, right? Yeah. There's no warranty. So again, like we all were in the same mindset as far as like, let's do it right and not just paint it that you know, deal with issues uh, because you're planning holy, right? Uh, yeah. So we just talked about, we, we spent about a million one, just on the million one um, on the acquisition. They actually have to be almost exactly million one also the rehab within two, two. Um, maybe walk us through the, the appraisal and the financing, you know, kind of all that structure, the rental income. Uh, just like bigger picture, the whole deal. Yeah, let's talk about the. I mean, let's let's start um, at the at the refi, which you know is also something that's not a. We don't did do a conventional refi um, out of our you know kind of bridge investment construction finance. We did it a little bit different. So let's right. let's touch on that too. Yeah, and that worked out pretty well too because we got an as is appraised value. Um, when we only had 11 of the 17 units rented for 2.79. And that was then valuating the building off of just what we had there, the 11 units being rented. So now that we have the complete 17 units rented, the valuation on that is 3.4 million. So with the acquisition price of 1 million one to round up, and then you know another 
million dollars for the renovation. Equity, which is a pretty good play for a project of this size. And then when we we used a uh, Renovo financial, shout out to Brendan because he knocked it out of the park for us. He and did. When we purchased it. Um, and then end of 2022, we did a refi uh, with a bank, right? But we did a we did a refi where we got additional construction money to finish the remainder of the units, you yeah. know, phase two, um, that then pretty much converts into into permanent uh, debt. You want to touch on that real quick? Yeah, and that permanent debt actually worked out really well too because it was interest only financing while we finished the construction phase which was very helpful because it let us use some of the cash flow from the rents to put that into the renovation budget, extremely helpful. And then once that converts over to the primary, you know, long-term financing, we're already gonna have those other units rented and be in a secure position. So that's the nice part of that loan structure. And if we wanna do a cash out refinance, that's always an option that's on the table for us as well, where we could actually recoup almost all of our original investment and still have a cash flowing asset, which at the end of the day, that's a, a win. And we discussed the strategy a couple of times, but maybe um, share with everyone else what are we, what was our conclusion when we talked about that, and where do we want to stand as far as um, longer value and cash flow in order to position the asset correctly uh, when we actually have everything rented out and, and do the cash out. Yeah, my opinion on that is always that you know cash flow is going to be critical. The um, value or equity is always nice to have, but if you're holding the asset long term, that's not cash in your pocket. If you have the cash flow every month, you're getting those you know returns, and you can see the investment paying off. You know you got cash to cover anything that pops up. It's never a huge liability. So if you can keep the debt at 65 to 70 percent of ARV, that's always the most comfortable position. Anything above that, if you're kind of pulling a little too much juice out of the deal, in my opinion. Let's talk. We talked just talked about uh, property management, right? If that's one of the other things you own, obviously outside our deal, a lot of other, how many units do you own right now, Tom? Um, including our new yeah. 17 package, I have 44 units. So you obviously deal with a lot of tenants, clients, neighbors, other stuff. You know, property management. Maybe walks a little bit through the ups and downs of you know owning so many units and. For the most part, everything has been very smooth, but that's because the property management team that we have is we put on this deal is great. They take care of it, they make sure we get highly qualified tenants, they're not just renting it to the first person that inquires. And that for long-term cash flow is critical because if you get a unit rented, but then it's vacant in four months or six months and you're missing out on those collections of rents, it's just gonna get you every time. So a key component to any good deal is definitely a good property management team, which thankfully we have here in Tucson. Any crazy stories so far? Nothing too crazy, but as you guys saw, we had a couple, you know, low rider tenants and stuff <laughs> at one of our buildings that we had to get out of there. But what is a low rider? A low rider is uh, you'll see a lot of them around here t in Tucson. Um, but a low rider tenant is someone that doesn't have a legit job, and uh, they're earning their income in mischievous ways. Okay, and they what kind of lease agreement do those tenants? Have? Yeah, I don't think they really have a lease agreement. So uh, what we normally do is give them a eviction notice and try and get them out of our properties. But for the most part, as you guys can see, we've had like college students and like great tenants in there. So if we get a bad tenant in most of our properties, if it's a fourplex, three of the good tenants are going to point it out to us, and we're going to be able to address that pretty quickly. We have some good stories on ours, and, and, and we had the, the naked guy that was full of drugs running off naked throughout the whole complex. Oh, yeah. That was a good one. We had the pig, the really guy that had a pig and took out all the papers in the backyard so we did come right around to some as, as you guys know, most of the good stories come from when you buy these projects, the people you have in them. I think when we bought this project, we thought we had maybe three or four tenants, but I think we found out we had maybe eight tenants. Some so living in the units. So low right at the tenant ratio, yeah, pretty much yeah. one to one. I mean, if you go back to your, <laughs> yeah, you go back to your original video. You're trying to take a video of the house and someone's in the unit that shouldn't be occupied at all. That's a little concerning. So we run into that all the time. Yeah. Then again, that was like a really the whole house was in really rough condition, right? I mean, structurally yeah. and everything. Um, and I, I think maybe touch a little bit on the difference because we look at another deal right now that we kind of all like, but it's maybe a little bit more turnkey. Um, 
So the difference between the more of a turnkey ready product versus a value product, ups and downs uh, from your perspective, because you do have a lot of investors too that buy finished product. Yeah, exactly. And I think the biggest thing that we all probably can agree on is if you're looking at a deal and you're not sure if it's a deal or if you got to sell yourself on it being a deal, it's never a deal you want to buy. Like that's one thing I've learned. Any deal I know I shouldn't have bought, but I talk myself into it and then I close on the deal is something that I end up having a loss on or a break even or it was a waste of time. So I think as long as we're all in like the general opinion that if we look at the deal, we love the deal, we buy it, that's the best way to kind of structure those deals. And there's always good exit strategies like we talked about on this deal. If it's two big parcels, we can sell one parcel for a profit, keep the other one at a better rate. There's a lot of good exit strategies we can kind of do. Just depends on the deal. What are, um, what are the goals? What are we trying to, what's our two, five year plan here? Yeah, so I mean, our collective goals, it'd be nice to see us grab another at least 50 units, I'd say, 40 to 50 units in the next 12 months. And if we can get, um, consistently keep growing on that, I think that'd be a no brainer. And then I'm sure you guys have goals on your own as well. Yeah, we definitely want to do a uh, deal with you back in our neck of the woods, right? In the Absolutely. In the Stenfi area. Uh, yep. You've been uh, busting your ass here, and I think this is a good opportunity to say thank you. You've been like nothing but amazing, and this is uh, this is a great first deal, and uh, we'll, we'll return uh, the labor favor and, and a couple of dip, throw a couple of thinners in there. There we go. Got there. That's all we need, man. And the deal was a win for all of us. That was the best part about this. But I mean, ultimately, that was uh, the first big project that we've taken on together as a group. And you know, running construction on that was definitely, it was definitely time consuming, but it was incredible to be able to see the deal come together. At the end of the day, the equity that was added to be able to have our first deal be such a win, I think that's no better way to put that in the books. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the, the way it all worked out too, you know, like we've done deals where, you know, you go over cost or over timeline, it gets a little spicy, right? Like, you know, people get upset or they feel like it's good. Like the fact that we all understand the process, understand how everything works, there were never issues with, you know, if something takes a little longer or something costs a little more because we all just know that how it goes, right? Yeah, and there was a, a moment during our bridge loan phase where I feel like we definitely were putting a lot more money into the deal than we wanted to. <laughs> the big, but, big event. Yeah, but we just need 20 more grand, yeah, then we're done. Hey, we week. need another 30. Yeah. When does this 30 come from? <laughs> <laughs> that got a little tight, but thankfully, you know, we got that pulled back out with our restructure and everything was good, so those are, uh, these are the deals that we like to do, and if we can get a couple more of these in the books, I mean, we'll be in good shape. Yeah, I mean, we just talked about this being our first bigger deal. Um, let's maybe, in general, because I mean, obviously there's a lot of like younger agents that you know kind of listen to this, or you know, people that want to get into real estate. What are your like, you know, tips and advice for somebody that's like starting out, or maybe agents that you know been selling for a while but want to get into development or multifamily? Like, give some like advice to like you know. Uh, younger up and coming guys yeah and that's a question like I actually get asked a lot by agents and I think the best piece of advice I could tell anybody is to not get way too emotional about keeping every piece of property that you have for example if you just start by picking up single-family homes and duplexes there's gonna be times where you have to let one go to pick up a better deal or to get your cash flow where you want it to be so as long as you're keeping the deals that are no-brainer wins and you're moving the rest of the money forward into these great deals, you're gonna be in good shape. So as long as you're not overextending yourself and taking on the deal just to have a deal, you're gonna be in good shape. What was your very, very first deal? Does it have to be investment or development related? Your first real estate deal. What was it and when was it? Yeah, so my very first deal that I bought for myself was a single family home as an investment and it was $75,000. I bought a three bedroom, two bathroom home for $75,000. almost like our first deal. Yeah, so I was in heaven and to be honest, you know, at the time it was tough to come up with the money for the down payment on that, but we did it. And um, we ended up selling that house for around $145,000 after putting maybe 30,000 into it. But I held that one for a long term as a rental property, which was pretty nice. Very good. Yep. Uh, what are some of the, because obviously we try to give advice with you know, stuff like this, like the podcast. What are some of the you know, good advice and bad advice you've been given over the years from other people, you know, financially, business-wise, that, you know, looking back and said that was definitely kind of the shit or like, you know, that was like a huge 
game changer for my career. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I see, and it hasn't happened to me personally, but it's because it's always kind of been a fear of mine, is seeing investors and other agents get over leveraged. So if they're doing a fix and flip and they're borrowing 100% of the acquisition, 100% of the reno, and they're paying their mortgage payments at the end of the deal, that is something that they're probably not in the position they should be taking on these sort of projects. So I think it's always better to play any deal safe, have your own capital invested, and make sure it's gonna be a, a win, um, instead of kind of over leveraging yourself, whether it be for a rental or a fix and flip or anything at all, just make sure you're in a good, safe, secure position. And at the end of the day, we're all real estate agents, so I mean, we can all focus on sales. You can always increase your cash flow in safe, conservative ways. I don't think you need to go and try and flip a home to make a $100,000 profit just to save yourself a little bit of labor and footwork. Let's uh, let's leave the real estate side aside for a second. Yeah. So we know you you love to travel. Uh, I think you're definitely on the, the travel leaderboard from uh, from the three of us. Try. Um, tell us maybe I know where you were recently. That's also one of my destinations. But yeah. How how does that tie into your overall lifestyle and how does it help you to kind of stay focused and, and disconnect uh, while you're you know running all these different different businesses and how do you not uh, get like completely freaked out while you're like in, in a different time zone uh, while everything's going here yeah so one of my favorite things was like getting into real estate i was 100 percent working myself to the bone for probably four or five years and you know i earned a good income i got set up but i didn't spend those four or five years traveling or doing any of that stuff um, so once I got to that point where I felt like I had done well and I wanted to go kind of enjoy some of my success at the time, um, I started traveling. And what I did love about traveling was it taught me how to delegate because I was super obsessed with kind of taking on everything by myself. I had to be there at the inspection. I had to be there at the showing. I had to talk to every single client. And that's the way I was. And um, once I started traveling, I had to learn how to delegate, delegate those showings, delegate the paperwork, delegate the inspections. And doing that allowed me um, room to grow the real estate team. So it was kind of a blessing in disguise because it took me from being the one guy who's kind of running everything to being able to delegate um, and hire kind of those critical components, an assistant or a showing agent and all of those little things really added up. And so now when I travel, still getting 100 emails and 100 phone calls, but at the end of the day, I know I've got people to forward them to and that are here to help me get them taken care of. So that's critical. Well, the other thing that you're obviously uh, good at is using uh, miles and stuff to travel, right? Like uh, we always yeah. call and text you about advice on how you do it. Yeah. I still don't get it most of the time, but um, obviously there's a, we've seen in other people, like you, you rack up points by using you know, your credit card from flips and everything. Tell us a little bit about how you, how you figured that I'll tell you guys, the thing that got me to using points was a trip I took with one of my friends, Phil. I think you guys have met him before. But um, we were on the flight, and I actually used, I think, something absurd, like 60,000 American airline points or something to book, to pay for my Wi-Fi on the flight. And Phil actually almost choked me on the plane because that's the same amount of points he used to book his entire first-class <laughs> flight to Hong Kong on the same flight we were on. I used the same amount of points for the Wi-Fi as he used for his entire flight. <laughs> so from that moment on, I never booked another flight without consulting with Phil. And he's a point hack guru. So if you guys ever have questions, I mean, he shared a lot of info with me, but he's still the best. I consult with him on everything I do. And um, like I just told you guys, our October trip, first class flight to uh, Egypt on Emirates is only 87,000 points. So if you wait and look for the right deals, you can travel very far for a very good price. Yeah, maybe uh, give the same advice you gave to us like uh, before we started. Uh, just a couple of nuggets on your on your experience and where to go, where to, how to convert the points, right? Because uh, I think there's uh, some good info here. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, we always use, um, I like booking any first class flights on Amex because you get a 35% rebate. So if you use 100% points, you get a 35% rebate. So if you do the math on that, a $3,000 flight, you're getting $1,000 off right off the bat if you use all points. So little simple things like that are great, but then um, also exchange websites and platforms. I think it's called points.me. Does that mean using your actual card or using the actual points before converting? 
Oh, points before conversion on Amex okay. if you're booking direct. But if you can convert points, sometimes there's some crazy deals where you can convert one Amex point into like four Singapore that's Airlines what, or Asia Air, think, yeah. Emirates. Sometimes there's some insane deals where you can get four to one points on Marriott Bonvoy for a hotel, stuff like that. So I always take a look at them and if I think it's a good deal, then I call Phil to make sure it's a good <laughs> deal and then I'll book them. So that's the nice thing is just having good resources. Same with anything we do. Real estate, travel, it's all about having good resources and connections. Yeah. Where's the best place you've been? Best place I've been to is still like without a doubt my favorite place is Dubai. I don't know why, but it's just like a different level of living out there. So. Um, been to a lot of countries like Bali, Thailand, as you guys all know, there's just something about traveling somewhere that seems like it's kind of futuristic and Dubai was definitely that place. So you're, you're in Tusa and you always come up to Scottsdale, like uh, any, you gonna stay in Tusa for a longer time, like you have any plan, like you usually travel a lot, you see somewhere that could just send, see what, like, you ever get the itch to like, you know, move somewhere else and do something else or you like- The record for the past three years, Oh, yeah. at least you said you're gonna yeah. move up, but we also talked for three so, years and then we did business, so maybe this yeah, year? Maybe. It's, <laughs> we're still dating. I'm not sure about Scottsdale yet. So, um, what I'm looking to do is I mean, I would love to be up there. Every time I see you guys close the deal, I'm like, I should be up there doing some real estate in Scottsdale. So, I think what I need to do is pretty much just figure out a way to duplicate what I have here up in Scottsdale, and that would be the best structure for me. So, I mean, I love the Tucson market because as you guys know, it's about connection to you know and everything. And I've been doing real estate in Tucson for 10 years. So getting to know a lot of the investors, a lot of the sellers and a lot of people that you kind of nurture those relationships for so long, you don't want, really want to step away from those. So I'll definitely have a place short term up in Scottsdale without a doubt, but Tucson is home for now. Well, be our guest anytime. We have uh, two, two guest bedrooms and uh, in the future, probably a little bit more. So that's what I like to hear. Anytime. Right. Um, other thing is, I mean, we know you, you delve into some other businesses too, right? Because as most of us, you know, real estate is your daily income. That's where you make your money. That's how you. That's where you know everything, right? Like that's that's where you're the goat. And then, but you tried a little bit in Amazon. You know, we you got some JV deals going. Kind of tell us a little bit about what else you got. You know outside of real estate and on the business side. Yeah, and that's what I love, right, is real estate gives you a great grounds to be able to expand, invest, try new things, see what works, see what doesn't work. And for me, anytime I try to expand into something new, like Amazon drop shipping and these things, a lot of people have success with these, but for me, a lot of it seems too good to be true. When someone says completely passive income, 20 grand a month, it's only 50,000, Okay, sign me up, but then once you see the real numbers, I mean, by the time you factor in all your taxes, shipping costs, the person handling the return, all these things, all the, returns, returns, returns. all the red flags on your account pausing stuff, like, it's just too much, right? So what I think I like to do and stick to is working with people who specialize in whatever industry they're in, making sure you have or whatever the case may be, is anything that you still want to add? Yeah, so what I like to do is literally, I think being like a passive investor in a good solid business is always a great idea. So if you can plan your money somewhere and you know it's gonna provide cash flow in the future and it's got the value to appreciate, whether it's a restaurant or anything, I have a lot of friends in Tucson who have done very well by simply investing in partnerships and you know businesses, restaurants that they can see the return on. So. Well, one, one question that I um, that I was curious about is how do you how do you stay motivated and what's what's your personal game plan right outside of deals I mean you you're obviously still very young you have a lot of experience but uh, we also know you you enjoy the fine things in life and you don't want to kill yourself uh, working for the rest of your life so uh, give us give us some insight here yeah I somewhere and have you know a hundred grand a month coming in it sounds great but at the end of the day we'd all be bored to death after one month of that and be back to working or investing or trying to build or develop something new it's like the the chase of a good project and the chase of growth that's like what keeps me motivated none of us like to stay in the same spot so when we can see growth and you know development happening that's what 
at the end of the day, it keeps us going. So, yeah, I mean, the question we always ask, um, you know, if you look back 10 years, if you could sit down with Eddie 2014, right, when you just got started, what advice would you give yourself, you know, with everything you know now that you didn't know back then? You yeah. Know, make your life easier and, you know, maybe even like, you know, more, you know, even more successful or faster. Yeah, without a doubt, my best piece of advice to my younger self would have been to hold on to those appreciating assets. There was a million deals where I chased, you know, a $65,000 wholesale, a $100,000 wholesaler assignment. When in hindsight, I had people who were like, in the game longer than me in real estate. And they're like, you realize that you could just keep this deal, refinance it, and then pull out your money tax-free in you know six or eight months. And instead of doing those deals where I was kind of pulling out the cash in the future a little less, I was kind of just taking the bigger assignments of checks and stuff like that, which is great, but at the end of the day, we all know our biggest and only consistent business partner for life is gonna be Uncle Sam. And when you are making those big, consistent checks like that, you're gonna be spending a lot of money on those taxes. And so when you're accumulating real estate assets like these rental properties and the larger units, you're just saving yourself a fortune, not just because of the cash flow and appreciation, but also the tax play on everything. So I definitely think I would've held a lot more real estate um, starting off earlier in the game. Which, you know, that's probably the, the same advice that we would give to ourselves too. At the same time, it's a very fine line, right? You've gotta, you've gotta get, get out of just making commissions and you need some big pops right to be able to have the you know, you know the money available to you actually afford to have in assets that are just producing the cash flow right yeah. so um, so I guess that's always a fine line we, we we are starting to shift but I also think that's that's a place where you know you gotta you gotta be able to work yourself in a place like that where you can afford um, to have, I mean, we have a lot of money tied up um, in Tucson um, with our own cash, right? And we're not going to pull everything out. Um, and we have that money at, not at risk, but we had that money invested for, for a while now, right? So if, if the, we would be dependent on that money as far as paying our rent, right, that would have been an issue. Exactly. Yeah, you always have to have like good cash reserves. And that's one thing I learned, you know, in business coaching, that was probably one of the best things I ever did is to have at least six months of all your expenses and reserves in any account you have, whether it's your business accounts, living expenses, you probably want more than that in reserves before you start investing that capital. Because as we all know, there are good deals and there are bad deals. And anytime we're making an investment, it could be great when we buy it, but 12, 18 months, if the market changes like we just saw happen, it can really change those numbers on those deals. So just keeping that cash flow, the reserves, being conservative and you know making the smart play, that's the best thing you can do.